Molly. Welcome to our second Sebastopol Historical Society gathering presentation. Um, first, I'd like to make a plug for the Historical Society. We are new within our first year, and this is what we envisioned when we started, as far as I'm concerned. Being able to do awesome, uh, have awesome presenters teaching us, showing us, sharing with us about the past, the present, possibly the future, who knows. Um, and having all of you wonderful people come and join us, learn, get educated, and of course share. Anyone who would like to do a presentation for us in this same manner, or from your home, from your farmstead, whatever it is that you may have, your family may have done in the past, we can come to you and videotape, do it at your place, if that's where you're comfortable, and show it, and you could come and watch and then maybe answer questions. You don't necessarily have to get up here like these brave gentlemen and, uh, and do it live in person. So though we do have a lot of different options, but we do want Sebastopol family histories, you know, activities, all of those kinds of things as a collection. That is our focus and that is our goal. Um, so anytime that you would like to talk to one of us about doing it, obviously you would be more than welcome to have you up here. Also, if you'd like to join the Historical Society, we have that information for you. Also see one of us um, whenever, today or a different day. I'm going to go ahead and introduce to you our, uh, as you can see, our loggers. They are going to show us tools from the early 1800s of logging and uh, share with us all of their fun, fun things that they have learned and collected and done over the years. Also, I want you to know that they are currently loggers. However, I was joking with Mike that I hope maybe they updated their stuff a little. And uh, he said, yeah, maybe a little. I was talking to my daughter earlier today about, uh, about what I wanted to say to introduce to them, and she said, what do you always say about Mr. Madden? And I said, he was the best fourth grade teacher I ever had. So. <laughs> Thank you guys. Add yeah, that Sevastopol, there was she only had one fourth grade teacher. <laughs> but you were still the best. Yeah. Daylight in the swamp, get up you lazy jacks. It's time to eat your stove lids and your black slap. Uh, some reasons we got interested into this is uh, both Pat and I enjoy collecting tools. He's gone way overboard. His garage is a museum of hand tools, uh, agricultural and, and uh, farming and uh, logging and all kinds of other tools. And uh, if you ever get into the learning and retirement classes, once in a while he, he has a class out at his place showing some of his tools off. I got interested in tools because I was a fourth grade teacher teaching about Wisconsin history. And I happened to be in Harry Porter's office in the bottom of the government center once and saw how neat it looked with the tools in his basement on the barn lumber and I created a barn lumber museum in the back of my classroom. And uh, it uh, proved to be very uh, useful, especially in teaching some of the things about the past. If any of you uh, have read Laura Ingalls Wilder's Farmer Boy, a lot of these tools are mentioned in there, and that's a great resource for uh, learning about how they were used. My brother Pat lives uh, just off Hornspear Road. He and his wife Joanne do quite a bit of logging yet, and a lot of firewood. And my wife Barb and I live in Sturgeon Bay, but we have a Woods and Jackson port that we use a lot. And if you were married to either one of us, there would be at least one day every weekend you'd spend in the woods. <laughs> Whether you wanted to or not, right? <laughs> More of a hobby and a little exercise than anything. Mm -hmm. um, we do uh, sell firewood. We do uh, sell logs at times. I brought in a price listing of uh, some of the logs, I just took some down to Algoma Lumber, and uh, I was interested in 2004, I was lucky I had a veneer log of maple, uh, and I got a $181 for the log, that one log. And then I had some other ones too that didn't make the veneer, but if it would have been 2004, I'd have gotten over $400 for that same log. So the prices of, uh, the lumber fluctuate in the logs quite greatly, so you might enjoy looking at that. Also playing over here, there's the, uh, a neat video, and another video that's uh, very good for research is the uh, Door County Historical Society did one of the loggers of Door County. And uh, Mike and Jamie, you're on here much younger, but you're on this one too. <laughs> but it's very good, I just watched it again this morning and it's a good resource. 
in the back of the room on the table behind the Henschels, there's some uh, what is it's. I know Carl brought some in and Pat brought one in and I brought one in. There's a couple of them back there. If you can guess what the one with the long piece of wood or the one with the handle is, we have a special prize for you today. So uh, be sure to take a look at that. I'd like to thank Linda and everybody else involved in setting it up with the lots of things to eat here. And uh, thank Don and uh, Warren for helping me carry in most of the things. And uh, now we'd like to show you some of our tools. Whenever I'd bring this into the classroom, my students would think about, somebody's head's going to get chopped off. <laughs> but the axe is one of the most basic tools in logging, and it has been. Uh, most of our tools are from the uh, 1800s. Um, Pat, you have an axe that is, yeah, one of the oldest types that we've seen in books, but he just got it uh, last year. And if uh, you had pioneering uh, people in your family tree, this is what their axe might have looked like. I had gotten this over in Africa. I was there a couple years ago. And one day we did a thing up in Fish Creek Days, and a guy gave Mike a book on axes. And like he said, about the 1800s, we had the same exact axe here. Can you hold it up, please? And they're still using tools like this over there and stuff. I mean, they haven't came to the times like we have. The most common axe that the lumberjacks used was the uh, double bit axe. I think it's over there. <laughs> and in the uh, um, early 1800s, this is what they'd use to chop down the trees. And uh, it was uh, time consuming. Most of the logs were chopped off about this high because that was the easiest way to do it. So anything down below was wasted. Uh, the two-bit axe, I like two bits. Pat's got a one bit there uh, that was more uh, unitarian. You could turn it over and use it as a sledge or as an axe. But in the woods, this was nice because if you got one end dull, you could use the other. And it must have been quite a challenge to knock down some of those huge trees using an axe like this. While we're on the axe theme, we'll look at a few of the other ones we have. This one large one I held up before is called a hewing axe. And if you've seen hewn log cabins, this might have been a tool that was used. They would make cross marks in it. Uh, I hope there's no dents in the floor when we're done. We do have a <laughs> <laughs> And you might have seen these if you've ever seen a log cabin. And then you could use it this way to level up the... Or another way of uh, smoothing out the side was using an ads. And great word if you're doing crossword puzzles. Yes. <laughs> and this could be used in several ways, but this is one way that I found is the easiest for me to do. And if you come back next Tuesday, I'll have this log squared off. <laughs> and Linda will have found all the wood chips. Pat's got a little different type of ads. This is called a ship's ad, ads, and it has shoes on the sides. And it was like for trenching out beans and stuff. And then it had a little, this used to be straight on it. And we don't know for sure if it was used for rolling the timbers or one guy had told me it was for poking holes in, so. By the way, any time you want to throw in some comments or corrections or uh, additions, please do so. I've got a good friend in the audience that uh, often says all of us together are much more intelligent than any one of us alone. And Pat has said, the more they talk, the less we have to. <laughs> so. This is a brush axe, and they use it for clearing areas of small trees and brush for making roads or trails. Anybody with an idea what that could be? Nick? That's a picaroon. Charlie Bordeaux gave me this one. And uh, it was often, if you want to move around logs, it's a good way to move them. 
people that uh, loaded a lot of popple when uh, they were loading loads of popple, you could pick up a log by yourself or easy that way. It was just an extension of your reach. Mike, have you been to the uh, uh, farm, farm? They have a pickaroon saloon. Why, where does he always come up with these? The interesting they're Yeah, they are? <laughs> Not when I was there with you, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Dick? Yes, there is, or this one is a either or. Uh, it can be used. I've seen where there some are shaped, they're sharpened only on one side, and uh, sometimes the handle has a little bit of a bend in it too. Can you imagine hewing all those barn beams? You try and invent something to make it a little easier somehow. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed the handle, but it's kind of a neat handle on it. It's got a nice bolt to it. This particular one, like you said, though, it is straight on, but I've seen them already where it comes like off to the side even. I just mentioned popple. A lot of people uh, in the Northwoods would uh, cut popple to sell for the paper industry, and they would get paid more if the popple was peeled. And this is a peeler. You could uh, score the log and get the bark off the popple, and you'd get a higher price for it. Can you use it on grapefruit? <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? Can you use it on grapefruit? <laughs> Um, the next thing I think we'll go into the saws. You want to hold up your old one, Pat? And That's okay. About the mid 1800s, um, they started sawing logs instead of. Uh, chopping them down. And maybe somebody can help me on this a little bit. I believe it was the invention of this type of tooth right here that made that happen. This is called a raker tooth. These are the saw teeth, these are rakers. Before the raker was invented, if you tried using this on a large wet tree, it would just plug up the saw. But at about the mid 1800s, this type of tooth was invented, and then they really went to town. You can see there's quite a variety of different types of handles and stuff. This would have been a one-person saw, where both of those would have been like a two-man saw. And if you're, uh, as I said, we do most of our logging with our, our wives as helpers. And if your wife was there to help, you could put the handle on the other end of this one. Or if you weren't sure of your marriage, you could get one like this and use it by yourself. <laughs> This is another type of saw called a buck saw, and it's used for buck, bucking up uh, wood. Also, many <laughs> carpenter saws look just like that. It does not have the raker teeth, but it's used in this manner on a saw buck. Maybe I better cut the end one first. Huh? That's a nice smell. We call those wood cookies. And uh, we invite you all to make your own wood cookie today. And uh, to do that, we'll be using this saw. It doesn't have a great amount of sharp teeth, but on this soft wood, it works very well. So Pam, would you go and take that in, please? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, 
Okay. This has many names. Lumberjack is often called this a misery whip. Okay. Yeah. So, and there's a few rules with using it too. Okay. Everybody has to pull their own weight. <laughs> okay. Nobody can push to help the other one. If I ended up trying to push to help you, it would bend. So okay. it's also called the come to me, go from me. Or, it has a lot of different names. <laughs> so. No, you don't push, you pull. Mark? This is how you can really tell, you know, if they're... How long will we stay married? Yeah, right. Okay. Long side always... Short, short side pulls. Long side just follows. And you might notice Mark tried to help a little bit by pushing there and it bound it up. You get to keep the cookie, yeah. It's white cedar, but the, the second most sought after wood in the, in the woods of Wisconsin. First was the white pine. The white pine uh, is a, a wonderful wood for working. It uh, doesn't shrink much, the dimensions stay the same. It's easy to work. Would you show them the wedge of the white pine I have over there, Pat? Right there on the floor. This is a wedge I cut out of one of the biggest white pines I've cut down. Um, and it was the log that the, the tree that the lumberjacks came here for. There were huge stands of white pine on Door County uh, from Sturgeon Bay to Egg Harbor on the bay side and around Jackson Port on the lake side. And that is the, the lumber that they made their money on. Next was the cedar. Uh, it was sold in uh, huge schooner loads, uh, fence post out west. It was used uh, to make shingles and so forth. There's a picture on the wall over there in the wooden frame of uh, some of my wife's grandfathers had a um, 40 that they log cedar on, and there's some huge piles there. Uh, the 40 was down where you live, uh, Dick, in that area and they would spend uh, several days there each week and in the winter and make those huge piles of cedar uh, posts and rails and poles. And the same pictures are at Whitefish Dunes in their uh, historic area. Talk on the canned hook. What we have here is called a canned hook. It was used for like rolling your logs you can grab it like that, a great big log, and you can turn it. They used it a lot of times when they loaded logs, when you had to turn a log to saw it the rest of the way off. Jamie, that's what you used to use before you went all hydraulic, right? <laughs> oh, do you? Well, you can't move the log unless you use it. No. <laughs> no. It doesn't have an apostrophe in it. Uh, the word can't means to tip and turn. So here is a version of the cant hook, but this one has a uh, point at the end. This is called a PV. And this was used um, quite often by people that worked in uh, the ponds where logs were floated. And this could be used to turn the logs to help prevent jams, or you could use it to stab the log and direct it in the water. That's a peavy. I'm pretty proud of this one because my brother Pat doesn't have a peavy. <laughs> Mike, I have a question about. Yeah. Cedar. I've heard that Door County Cedar has like a higher sand content in an intensive doll equipment. Is that urban legend? Is that true? What do you know about that? Well, I know that my chainsaw gets dull quicker. It does pick up silica, doesn't it, Harry? Or what are they? How do they say it? Okay. Uh, 
Carl, you talked about the cedar having silica in it as it grows, and uh, it picks it up from the soil. I believe it does, yeah. yeah. Uh, Mike, do you notice a difference yeah, when you're sowing cedar? Well, it's got some legitimacy yeah. to it, yeah. so. Sure, yes. This is a two-man log carrier. Has like the same arm that the cant hook had. And that was used mainly like for carrying logs out of the woods. There'd be a man on each side and you'd pick it up and carry the log. The one that Mike and I usually use, the hook is more over on this, on my side than his. <laughs> <laughs> it equals all pretty good though. Or better yet, if you have a team of horses, you can hook this on the log and the pull of the horses will tighten around it. I found this one in my woods years and years ago. Uh, the woods that I owned was owned by a Carlson in Jacksonport. And uh, I know the Bly's logged in there at one time and this was left behind. But uh, the theory is it just hooks on a log and as you pick it up the log, it'll tighten around the log and you can pull it without hooking a chain around the log. Oh, pull it from the end then, huh? Oh, okay. I have never seen one with three. Yeah, that's a good idea. And this isn't a logging tool, but I bet some of you recognize what it is. Uh, ice tong. And uh, while we're on the talk about ice for a minute, I've got a specialized saw right here, which is an ice saw. And you chip a hole in the ice and then stand up above it. And up. And the down part's easy. <laughs> and that's how the ice saw was used. My newest tool in my collection is this, and it says, uh, oh, what did it say on there again? <laughs> <laughs> he gave it to me for a Christmas present. So. Ice and Fuel Company, the Des Moines Ice and Fuel Company. And then it's got the phone number on here. It's just a three. Four two two one. It was probably given as a gift, like uh, you go to a grocery store, they'd give you a can opener years ago or something like this. This was probably given out by customers of the Ice and Coal Company. And actually the ice and the logging had a lot to do to each another because the ice companies used the sawdust for keeping their ice through the summer. So a lot of times where you'd see a sawmill, there'd be an ice house. What was that used for? Probably You'd score the ice and then break the ice block with it. Or if you got too big a chunk of coal to put in your stove, you could break the coal chunk with it. Because at a point. Yeah. What if they saw a wood cookie? Can they get something special done to it? We'll give you a stamp on your cookie. <laughs> if you saw it yourself. This is actually a stamp for marking railroad ties. They had similar stamps for marking the end of logs. So when you would take them to the sawmill, they'd know who they belong to and stuff. But all we do with your cookie is we'll put it up here. And then we'll give you a stamp of approval. <laughs> There's a lot of them had letters or initials to identify the logs, so. They were in essence a brand, so when many logs might be floated down the river, you would know whose was whose. And floating down the river, this was a, a handy tool, a pike pole, that could be used to direct the uh, logs in the water. Evidently, it help you keep your balance on the log, too. Neither Pat or I can swim very well, so we've never tried doing the log part on the water. So. <laughs> What else you got over there to show them, Pat? This is a pro. 
was used for making shingles. They'd put their block and they'd have a mallet that they'd hit this with to split it. It's just like an axe blade on the edge. And it was a cottage industry for a lot of uh, farmers to uh, do that in the winter and, and uh, sell shingles. There's a, there was a mill in uh, where Tornado Park is, Williams, Williamston, what is it? Williamsonville. Williamsonville that produced mechanically a, th a million shingles a day. So they, they had a lot of shingles there. One other thing we have here that really doesn't have nothing to do with the logging, but it's a burl from a tree. This is from a cedar tree that grows on the root. I don't know if anybody's ever seen them before in the woods. Um, what's kind of neat is there is a big one here about 18 inches in diameter. That's the biggest one I've ever seen. I'm not sure what really causes the tree to, to grow a burl, but uh, kind of neat. And if you hold up that uh, piece of maple right next to it, Pat, with the markings in it, uh, Algoma Lumber on here, it said uh, they do not accept uh, maple logs that have that marking in it. And that was man-made markings in there. Uh, anybody recognize what it might be from? Yeah, that's where the maple tree was tapped. Those are spile marks. Uh, <laughs> which I wonder if we'll be getting any maple syrup this year. <laughs> And your brush thing you have to show me at Pat over there too. The brush axe I've showed that. You did? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Any questions about yes? Why did they, why didn't they want it to push it out? Um, if it's tapped and it grows over like that, when they buy a log, especially for veneer, they just slice off that very thin piece and that I don't know if you can see it from that far back, but it would leave a mark actually in your wood when you sawed the log. So even though it's grown over, it would leave a stain there. And is that throughout the whole? <coughs> no, for some reason, it's right about this high. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we're going to, unless there's any other questions, we're going to, go ahead. I've got a couple of measuring sticks at the cruisers used to do back, you know, back in 1800s and that for measuring trees and things like that for see how much cord feet was in the tree. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of them just straight and the other one bends like this that you could put in a pack. They're packed because they'd stay out there for weeks, you know, marking and measuring stuff. Did you bring it along? I, I wish I had. I do too. I've never <laughs> seen one like that. So. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Well, uh, I've never seen a, a scaling <coughs> rule that was curved. Uh, I know a few scalers that would like to bend it a little sometimes when they're measuring my log. Yeah. Got the numbers and everything all over. yeah, that's neat. Never saw one like that. Any other uh, tools that you might have that are uh, interesting from the logging era? Well, what, we're going to take a, a little bit of break now and, and have some. Uh, treats and listen to some stories and uh, and then uh, while we're doing that I hope some of you come and make your own wood cookie or pick up one out of the bucket it's your choice <laughs> and uh, after we have a little break time then we'll uh, open up to any stories and uh, talk a little bit about uh, logging in D Door County specifically okay thank you
tools that we have up here and those that were back there, they have one characteristic that we don't see today in tools. There is no place to hook a motor or an engine or any other power source except the human hand. And I think that's pretty significant. And I think that's a part of this show that we ought not forget. Um, over the past few years, I've been doing some research on a particular building that Historical Society found down near uh, Sturgeon Bay called the Hanson House. And that house was built in 1858 by a man by the name of Hans Hansen. Now, I often think about coming to Door County because if you remember uh, your history, after the War of 1812, this suddenly became the United States. We had, this had been uh, formerly a part of England and part of France. They lost it in the War of 1812, and it became a part of the United States, and with the passing of the Northwest Ordinance, Thomas Jefferson uh, declared that this area was open for development. Well, in 1832, uh, it was decided that they would have to survey it because according to that Northwest Ordinance, all the land had to be laid out in sections and, and, and uh, uh, in sections. And of course, the reason for that is that they anticipated a lot of immigrants coming to this country. Now, if you can imagine at that time, there were no roads, there were no direction signs, there was nothing. But these people went through here in 18, about 1832, and they surveyed it. And all they had was a sextant, they had a compass, and uh, a, a, what they called the chains. And they surveyed this, they laid all of these sections out. Now, when I was in county board, and this was just with those very simple implements, this was the, the, when I was on the county board back in about 1975 or so, the state uh, ordered that all of the monumentation marks be, be reestablished. In other words, there was some question as to whether or not these marks that were put in 1830 were accurate. Lo and behold, with the best instruments that they had at that time, and that was before GPS, they determined that every one, except a very few, were right exactly in line. Now, isn't that incredible? I mean, these people were walking through a thick forest, carrying a chain with a compass and a sextant, and they established what these, what these points were. And how did they mark them? They sometimes would, would mark the side of a tree, or they sometimes would, would dig a uh, hole and bury a piece of cedar at a certain point, put a little mark on top of it. And when they came back and reestablished those signs, they found they were all exactly where they should be. Can you imagine if they had been 25 feet off, the problems we'd be having with land disputes? I mean, it was, it was right, it was accurate. And I, I can't help but think of the, the capabilities of these people to be able to do that at that time. And ever you notice, every so often there's a little jag in the road. You get up here on, what is it, on uh, Town Line Road, there's a little jag in the road. Well, those were little jags that they put in the map to accommodate the fact that as you go north, the earth gets smaller. And they compensated for that with that little jag in the road. And, and, uh, and even that is accurate. So they knew what they were doing way back then. But then after the surveys were done and the, the, uh, uh, with the problems in Europe with overpopulation, with all the wars that were going on during that period, there was a great influx of people coming to Wisconsin, coming to America. And a lot of them came to Wisconsin simply because the land was going to be free. All you had to do was stay on the place for five years and build a house, and you could claim that land, free land. Can you imagine anybody in Europe ever thinking of having free land? Free land, land was something that was so scarce over there that because as the generations went down the line, it kept getting divided up to get smaller and smaller and smaller pieces to finally got to the point they couldn't make a living on it. <coughs> so all of a sudden, <clears throat> here's America, the great promise. You come over here and the land is yours. 
if you, if you meet some of the conditions. And they did. They came in droves. They came by the thousands. Some came to Wisconsin and some went west. Some went to Minnesota. Some went uh, uh, throughout the United States. But most of them came down, uh, at least my grandparents, great-grandparents, came down the St. Lawrence Seaway into the lakes, sailed across the lakes, went to Chicago, came up to uh, uh, near Milwaukee, and there there was a, a, a place where they could branch off. Um, you could go west, you could go south, you could go north. My grandparents, unfortunately, thought it would be nice to go north. They could have had a chance to go west, but they came north. They got here and they just loved it because it looked just like Norway. And it did. It had a lot of trees, it had a coastline, it had a lot of stones, and that's just something that... <laughs> the Norwegians were very attracted to stones. They liked stones. <laughs> stones and lutefisk. <clears throat> I don't know if there's a connection there or not, but they, that's what they like. So they came up here, and they, a lot of times, though, there would be one that would come first. He'd, he'd be kind of the scout. He'd come out and find out where the good land is, and then he would, he would establish, uh, find that out, send word back home, and then, then the, the family would come. But when they made those first surveys, there's another little thing that they did. They made these maps, and I've got some examples of these maps that were made in 1830. Is that the people who went through, they also identified what timber was on that land. They could go through there and they could, they, uh, the loggers, the people who wanted to make millions of dollars with logging, could simply page through this, this work done by these surveyors, and they could say where were the good logs were, where was the good timber, where there was maple or pine or birch or, or, or uh, whatever. That was marked on this map and where the sections were. So these people, particularly in northern Wisconsin, had an opportunity to go and find where the good wood was simply by paging through this book and establishing claims. And that's what they did, a lot of them did. But for the average immigrant that came over here, what he wanted to do, he wanted to be independent and he wanted to own some land and he wanted to raise his family. So he came over here, whether because of somebody else sent him or whatever, or somebody sent a message back that there's good land here. And they came here and they, uh, they, they, um, uh, uh, they established their claim. But can you imagine the shock when you come here and you see this free land and the trees are so big and so close together that you almost had to start out on one side of the woods in order just to get them falling because they were so thick and so big and so heavy. And, and, but that didn't deter them. But the only thing they had, can you imagine yourself now? The only thing you had in your hand was that ax. You didn't have a lot of these other tools, you didn't carry around. The ax, that, the broad ax, uh, the, the, the chopping ax, whatever. That was the first thing that you had in your hand. And with that, you had to make your home. Now in the case of Mr. Hansen, he was a, 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 a talk about his particular house. I mean, there were all kinds of log houses. There's a Norwegian log house, there's a, the, the, the German, the Swiss, and all of this sort of stuff. And you can tell the different kinds of log houses by the corners that they made. And one thing about Mr. Hansen's house, why it's unique, he used techniques to build that house in woodworking that have been used in Norway all the way back to the 14th century. And we're rebuilding that house right now and we're rebuilding it using his techniques so that, that will be a, a house that will be show people how Hans Hansen built his house. But that was special. Most of them wanted to get that house up because winter was coming and uh, they were tired of living with their, their neighbors because there was maybe 10 or 15 or 20 people in a house. They had to feed themselves and they had to make wood and, and um, clean up the land so they could get a little land so they could begin to to open up so they could get a pasture and maybe they get a cow, uh, maybe a hog, and they could sell some of the lumber, some of that could be sold, there was a market. But generally there was not a great market for the abundance of great timber that was here. So what they did, they'd pile it up and they had big huge brush piles and they would burn it. Hence the Pestico fire was one of the examples of that kind of thing after a long period of drought and a lightning storm, 
they'd have the terrible fires. And they did occur. Not here so much, but uh, they did occur. And so with that, I can never think and, and, and be proud of these first people that came to Door County when all they had was a hope to own some land and an ax to work it, to work the woods off so they can get a cow and then they could produce a little butter for themselves. Pretty soon they could have two cows and they put a little butter for somebody else. And pretty soon we had the makings of an industry. But before all that could happen, that thing right there and two human hands are what cleared the brush. Now there is no virgin forest left here. But there's a story about up in Ephraim where the pines were so tall and so thick that, and, and there was nothing growing on the, underneath them because that's, it was so heavy, the foliage was so heavy, that you could drive a buggy through that pine forest. And, and it was just like driving under an umbrella. So you can imagine that the, the wonderful timber that was here. If only the forefathers would have seen fit to leave 100 acres untouched so that we could actually visualize what that virgin forest looked like. And if you ever want to get some idea, go up on Martins Hill and stand by that golf course up there right on that point and look out over the town of Sevastopol. And I think we made a video a while ago, Letty, about that. Look out over that and imagine if you would have been one well, of the first Spanish people that came through in 1650 or something like that, and the progressive that people came through and looked over this place and saw nothing but solid trees. And look at it. 200 years later, here we have a fully developed community. And remember, from the time of the American Revolution until now, it will require only three 80-year-old, fully, full, if they're born one after the other, uh, one was 80, another one was born lived 80. From that three human lifespans, we have changed this place from a, from a uh, wilderness to a fully developed community. And we can thank our forefathers for that. And that's why I'm glad we've got this history thing going because this is really an important story for you to remember. And when you think of the pioneers, and you think of these tools, think of the people that had their hands on that handle and did the work. Because there were no chainsaws, no electric motors, no nothing, not even a horse to help pull the wood out of the, tree, out of the woods. So keep in mind that when you look at this stuff and think about our community, and what it is, and, and, and how it got to be where it was. And think of how, we, how lucky we are. Uh, one of the greatest things that happened to me, and I think about this quite often, I always remind, remind Margaret. In the morning, when I, at 6.30, our furnace goes on. Big deal, huh? How many of you remember when you used to get at 6.30 in the morning, the furnace didn't go on? <laughs> and you, you had to go out and get some wood, build a fire, and warm the house up. Now, if you think we've got it, if, there, if things are bad in this country, now, just you had to pile that on top of all of your other worries. But that, how, how far we've come and how lucky we are and how fortunate we are to have forefathers like we had that had the ambition to go to work and make this thing work the way it did. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. 23 minutes. You were under that. When you started at 1812, I got a little scared. <laughs> Walking across Door County with this thing, and every time you get to a, a full chain, you put a stake in, you go on to the next section, and you just keep going along like that, and you count the chains, and you, you will determine what the sections are, and uh, all of the surveying that went with this. There was a, it, it was a big job, but it didn't take them too long to do it. And they were accurate. And not only was Wisconsin being surveyed, but um, other states were. And if you ever think, you ever get a chance to take a look at a map of, of Kentucky uh, and all of the states that were in the <clears throat> Union prior to the, to the, uh, to the um, Northwest Ordinance, and you look at the shape of the counties, our counties are nice and square. But if you look at those counties, you find they tend to be round. And the reason they're round is because it was determined at that time that the county seat had to be no more than one day's walk for a person from the outer limits to the county seat. 
And that's why you see they'll they'll have a survey that'll go from the from the river bank to the stone to the maple tree and back over to the river bank. Five or ten acres more or less. They didn't know. But here we've got section thirteen and so on and so forth and on so many acres. What a wonderful revolution that was. And we can thank Thomas Jefferson for for his his uh, uh, insight into making that happen. George, I appreciate your time. Thank you. And uh, I think you would all uh, help me give a, a uh, round of applause and a big huge thank you to Pat and Mike today. Thank you.